there's something magical in canine urbanism, yeah. <laughs> you know, that takes place. For sure. And, and I think it, it also makes me way more recognizable because like I'm a, I'm a pretty unremarkable looking person, but when I'm with the dog, like the two of us, it just kind of reminds me when you said like dogs and urbanism, it rhy- reminds me of the opening scenes of um, 101 Dalmatians <laughs> where yeah. you have all the dogs in the windows and they're kind of connected to their owners yeah. um, and you can match them. I used to have a little like a puzzle as a kid where you would match the dog to the owner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But it, it has actually helped in that way as well, because not only do people feel like they can come up and talk to me, but they recognize me as like the girl with the dog. Right, <laughs> and right. so um, I become a friendly face and uh, I often act as sort of the welcome wagon at, at Run Crew. Now I'm not the new person anymore, right? And so right. I often will be someone who welcomes others because like I will say hello and immediately my dog is you know all up in their business wanting pets and you yeah. know saying I love you. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns Podcast. I'm John Zimmerman, and that is Grayson Johnson from Ottawa, Canada. And Grayson and I have a conversation about uh, her main passions, <laughs> running and uh, infill development and some of those buildings that uh, we just don't see very much of in our neighborhoods and our communities anymore because they have been made illegal. And so we talk a little bit about that, some urbanism stuff up front, and then we uh, dive into uh creating a culture of activity within one's communities, sociability and connectedness and how walking and biking and running in our community helps facilitate that. It was such a joy for me to be able to catch up with Grayson and I hope you enjoy this conversation as well. Let's get right to it. Grayson Johnson, it's an absolute pleasure to have you in the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's nice to talk to you again. Uh, it's so, yes, it is so nice to talk to you again. Um, and it's been a while since we've seen each other. And uh, I can't even remember the last time. It must have been a CNU at, at some point in time. Uh, do you remember when that was? I think the last time I saw you was you were leaving very early for the airport. Um, mm-hmm. We were both staying at Jim Cooman's place. And you oh, had wow. brought your bike, your folding bike, <laughs> to get to the airport in Minneapolis. Uh, and I just remember being very impressed by that. So I think that was the wow. first time I might have seen you. Is, is basically first time like for a, sure. A yeah. And then we... Was that or the last... Sorry, yeah. I thought that was the last time, but maybe not. Yeah. So you were at CNU in Detroit. Yes. Yes. So Was that after Minneapolis? Oh, yeah, I, it would have been. I think so, yeah. So what you're referring to is you and I were together, and and we actually, you are, I can, I can credit you for, for this, uh, is that you were the, the one, I was traveling around the country uh, doing a lot of still photography, and we were both in Minneapolis at the same time, uh, basically for the Strong Towns, first national gathering, gathering national gathering yeah. and sort of after that event uh, the after the strong towns national gathering you know we walked over to the minneapolis open streets event that was going on it just happened to be that very same weekend and so i sort of tagged along with you and you were talking with me about shooting video because at the time you had been doing some video work for strong towns and producing some of, of the uh, the youtube channel the the, the videos that uh, the or strong towns organization was uh, working with and uh, or you were helping produce that and uh, but i had been just a, a a still photography guy at the time because I was traveling around the country trying to document active towns from from a still photography, and so you and I walked out and and uh, and and just shot some some photos and you were you were talking with me about you know angles and and getting in different perspectives and shooting video and so you actually shot some video. These are all just still photography that I was shooting with my iPhone, I think. <laughs> Maybe I had my real phone or camera. I can't even remember now. But uh, do you remember that? I totally remember that. I remember yeah. we sat somewhere and we were grabbing a beer and we were talking about, I think I was explaining to you actually uh, how the audio is the hardest part of video, I find, yeah. uh, especially if you're doing kind of uh, live on the, on the ground shots like that. Yeah. But a bunch of the footage from that weekend 
made it into a number of those strong talents videos. So I don't, I don't know if those are still um, played or, or uh, <laughs> used anywhere, but if anybody has seen some of the original sort of strong towns, yeah, I chat, way back when yeah. breakdown videos, not like Chuck yeah. delivering the chat, but right. um, yeah. the little snippets on the chat, you may yes. recognize some footage from Minneapolis open streets, which was yeah. a lovely event. Yeah. Well, I'm happy good. to report that the um, Ola Arepa restaurant uh, mm -hmm. that was featured in there in a in a food truck is still delicious. Wonderful, <laughs> it's great. Yeah. <laughs> that is fabulous. That's fabulous. Um, so usually, what I do with my guests is is right after our, our initial hellos, I give you a chance to introduce yourself. So we didn't do that because we started reminiscing. <laughs> so uh, why don't you just take a moment to introduce yourself? Who is Grayson Johnson? Oh, wow. What a hard question, actually. Uh, hi, I'm Grayson Johnson, and I live in Ottawa, Canada now. I currently work for the Federal Housing Agency here. And uh, so that's a group that delivers our housing programs, um, and I work in our innovation department. So I'm constantly working with people that are in the field, nonprofits, different governments, um, to try and figure out how we can do more with less to, to create more affordable housing. So that's my day job now. Um, and in my life uh outside of that i spend a lot of time just hanging out in the neighborhood meeting my neighbors running around with my dog as you'll see today and um i am pretty much just obsessed with small buildings i have a passion for buildings that are um that look like they're handmade in a way that they've been loved for a long time that are humble and they do hard work uh, so i i have sort of a, a side project that i've had for many years called step buildings um and it's a uh, like a portfolio of all of the different 50 kinds of infill that you could have in a neighborhood right. that normal people have been doing for for thousands of years. So yeah. that's uh, that's my passion. I love buildings. I work in them full time. <laughs> and uh, and I also love moving my body. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Well, and you mentioned running. And so running is, it was very much a, a, a sub theme of of our time that we've spent spent together over at least the the, the more recent years um, at the various CNU uh, gatherings that you're that you have been able to to attend. And so mm -hmm. this is in uh, Detroit. And, I, and so I this may be the last time that we were, uh, if that was your last to seeing you, uh, then, then this might be the last time. And so, um, yeah. why is, you know, talk, talk a little bit about running and, and there you are you, with, Jen, <laughs> with Jen Krause. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so talk a little bit about, about running and why running is, is such a, a, a critical thing for you. Yeah, I, I have loved to run since I was 12 years old. Um, you know, I I actually got into it. This is a little bit embarrassing to say, but honestly, it's an important thing to say for, for girls out there. I got into it when I was 12 because I thought that my legs were too fat, which is <laughs> comical, uh, comical now, but and heartbreaking. But I'm so glad it introduced me to running because the second I started running, it did not become about body image. It was all about just feeling powerful in my body and so i've loved running i've never been a competitive runner i'm not particularly fast um, but i have just loved it for years and years so ever since i was 12 did that um, i joined cross country when i was in high school um, i joined a, a group the more important thing was i joined a group in high school called the 200 club which encouraged you to run 200 kilometers between the cross country season and the spring sports. So okay. in Canada, that's not fun. Right, right. <laughs> Between November and March in Canada, and where I grew up was uh, London, Ontario. Uh, not a not a fun experience running. It's it's snowy, it's slushy, it's dark. Right. Uh, and so that was one of the most important things that I ever did in my life because it taught me to be consistent with running, to go out for the love of running. Um, it was never about speed. It was just about consistency of lacing up right. and getting out there when you didn't want to. And I think it's through that, like I grew up in a suburban environment and through running, I really explored it because there, there isn't really a reason to go anywhere in the right. suburbs other than your own street, right? right. Uh, but <laughs> when you're running, you're trying to clock distance and so right. you end up just winding. And I remember being astounded as a kid of like how much ground um, I could cover without really going anywhere just because all the streets right. were windy, windy, windy little cul-de-sacs. Um, so, you know, that's how I got into it. And I've just kind of been doing it ever since. Uh, it's a huge part of my life. It's um, 
how I explore and get to know a city. Yeah. And in more recent years, I, I've joined Run Cruise. Um, I did that a lot in Fredericton when I lived there, in Toronto, and now in Ottawa. And it's how I've met so many of my friends. And I find, um, particularly when you're um, when you're outside of a school environment, it's like it's a really wonderful way to just meet a huge diversity of people. Like. Right totally different ages, totally different industries, totally different incomes, like very politically different. You just get so much um, humanity and a rum group. Right. Uh, and, and you know, you have one thing in common, which is that you like cardio, but yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah and, and so that's, that's, you know, running is a lot to me. And we're going to come back to that theme and we'll come back to your, your run crew as well. And we've got some images that we'll kind of, uh, you know, flip through and we'll talk a little bit about the, that, connection that uh, especially for somebody who's moving to a community like you just did you moved to ottawa you didn't know a whole bunch of people while you when you made the move and so how you're able to to leverage that but before we get on to that i want to fill in just a little bit of a gap um in 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 your your backstory and your connection to that infill uh, development stuff because I had mentioned earlier you had done some work for for strong towns and then you spent some time with uh, within that sort of passion that you had of of buildings and the incremental development group talk a little bit more about that and then we'll pull up uh, your website for the step cards. Yeah, yeah. And actually running was a, a piece of what led me to that, because as I was saying, you know, in the suburbs, um, it, it takes a long time to get really anywhere because the streets are windy. And so when I was in high school, I started to realize, you know, if I wanted to live in communities where people could walk and do things that needed to be a more um, direct path for them, it's, it's really not reasonable to expect someone that's coming home from work and needs to pick up their kids and needs to pick up groceries and needs to do all of these things. Um, it, it's not going to really work if they are relying on a car for that. And so I ended up going into um, it didn't really happen until my master's, but I did my master's in urban planning. And I was really interested in what to do about places that are in decline and also places that are um, that are suburbs. How do we kind of adapt suburbs so that they can be more, so that people don't have to spend so much money on their car, really, uh, was, was the question there. And that led me into this world of, um, of infill development and focusing on how we can repurpose and we can love the places that we already have and do more with places that we already have rather than trying to build new, better places all the time. And uh, that was something um, that just introduced me to the Strong Towns movement. I had a, a friend in grad school that uh, was aware of Chuck. I went to grad school in the UK, but this friend was from Miami. And um, so she had heard of Strong Towns, and I just kind of reached out to, to Chuck when I got back to Canada. Um, I met him at a CNU and just said, hey, I really like your stuff, and uh, was sort of writing about some of my experiences in Canada as well and said, would you be interested in like a Canadian correspondent, basically? And uh, so I wrote for Strong Towns for a while just as a way to kind of discipline myself to, to write and to be thinking about these things. And I really connected with that crew. I was, you know, an early member of, of, of that community. Um, and so I ended up helping them with a whole bunch of different projects. And some of the people that I met through that experience were people that were doing actual infill. You know, they were doing small scale buildings. And um, that led me to team up with a number of, of co-founders to form the Incremental Development Alliance, which is a nonprofit that trains local people how to rebuild their neighborhood essentials. So it's it's housing, it's commercial, it's all mixed together. How can you fill in the mis missing pieces in your neighborhood? And how can you make sure that locals are able to do that, to lead the way with that and to benefit from it so that they're not pushed out by their own success? Uh, and so that organization was just, you know, uh, pretty much everything to me for about six years. Um, and during the pandemic, I had decided that I really wanted to focus on Canadian issues because I had been, I, I am Canadian. I've always been Canadian. I was working sort of remotely on this. I absolutely love the U.S. as well. I'm yeah. so happy for all the time I've spent there. But um, I was able to work on a project with Incremental Development Alliance in, in Windsor in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, which is right across from Detroit. And uh, it really opened my eyes to the differences in the housing issues in Canada and the US. And I wanted to apply myself and everything that I'd learned through Incremental Development Alliance to 
to my own um, situation. And uh, yeah, and so that led me to work with our federal housing agency where I am now. Um, and what you've got pulled up here, the, the step cards, um, this is my my little side hustle boutique sort of thing. I, I, I love this stuff so much, I can't stop doing it. And so <laughs> I've been kind of developing this for five years. I think there's um, therapy or something for this. I, <laughs> I love it, but I can't stop doing it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I yeah. mean, the therapy yeah. is, is, you know, is doing do it. it, is creating the art, <laughs> <laughs> creating the thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and so this is um, this is a deck of cards. I can actually pull up a physical copy right here. Yeah, nice. And they're in this little tin. And the idea is that you can um, you can take a look at 50 different options that local people might have to, to do some kind of infill in their town. And it's really helpful for... Um, for architects and for planners and, and city officials as well, because in a deck you can kind of uh, deal out um, as a as a card. You can deal out sort of a suite of buildings that are currently legal or currently illegal in your town to try and explain. You know, here's here's what we're here's what our plan says we want, but you know our rules are actually preventing this. You right. could have you could be working with someone who's really familiar with your market, and they can say, hey, you know what, I know this space really well. I'm going to deal out six cards here that I know are economically viable in this market. Yeah. And they may be all reno projects, not new build projects. Um, there's certain things that you can do with, um, with an FHA mortgage. Um, there's all these house hacks, um, things that are sort of uh, the next smallest step for people that are just interested in improving their neighborhood. And I have all kinds of improvements and sort of next layers to add to this uh, to help increase it as a, as a learning tool. And yeah. it just as something that is, is a fun little cute project to work yeah. on. Yeah. Two questions that I have on this. And, and I, as it's scrolling through, I'm noticing that you know, it looks like there's, you know, there's a front side to the card. And then there's also uh, a backside of the card, and it looks like there's some additional information uh, about that. Is that correct? Yeah. So all of the fronts are kind of like the Pokemon card for it, just mm -hmm. saying like, hey, this is this is what I am. They've mm -hmm. got sweets. The color is a sweet. Mm -hmm. So there's these different families of cards. Like they just showed a neighborhood node one, which is right. sort of a walkable neighborhood destination that could be mixed use, right. like a corner store. Yeah. And then on the backs, you've got specs. Um, and okay. the specs are really important because they're going to help you understand what kind of financing um, you would got use it. for this project. Yeah. Sort of a level of difficulty. Um, you know, do, is this something that you want to undertake um, with... It, some of them need a lot of cash, like the, the nature of the loan or the nature of the project is going to require that you have a, a pretty huge down payment. Right. And that's a really important thing for people to, to understand, right? You know, yeah. sometimes you need to do a few smaller projects with a little bit of cash before you can do something that's going to require like $100,000 plus of, of cash up front. Right. Um, so it's just helping people understand what level of commitment, difficulty, and some heads up that, that you might want to be aware of, you know, for certain things you can do a project, but within the building code or within the lending requirements, you can only have a certain amount of square feet um, yeah. as a particular use in order for it to qualify for that. So there's little heads up. This is all based on U.S. building code and like sort of general U.S. application of the building code. I will mm. like also provide the, the caution that every city applies it in a different way. Right. Um, so this deck is gonna be a completely sort of different interpretation in California, for example, where they have much stricter sprinkler rules because of forest fires and that. Yeah, but it's, it's sort of a guiding launching point for people to have these conversations and it's a tool that in particular, architects find really helpful in working with clients. Right, right. Being able to kind of line them up and talk a little bit about, you know, that challenge of, you know, like that shop house, you know, <laughs> what is, you know, what do we have to do to, you know, sort of change the, the conversation and change the dynamic and change, sometimes even change policy land use codes within our cities to be able to make those legal again because you had mentioned earlier oftentimes you know oh yeah sorry this one's illegal in your city at this time but yeah you know you start that conversation of saying well why don't we have more missing middle housing well there's a reason for this and you start having that conversation uh at the block level at the community level and then you know really starting to you know have that dialogue hopefully uh to be able to push through uh and and welcome change um many cities uh, around north america 
uh, are, are challenged in the sense that it is illegal to do a lot of these different typologies, housing typologies and building typologies. Um, and so when you try to do a land use change or a code change, uh, you know, within a city, oftentimes there's a knee jerk resistance or reaction or uh, a resistance that takes place um because it's fearful. It's like fear inducing. Oh, you want to change the character of our neighborhood. Da, 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 da. So it's uh, it's nice to be able to have something like this to be able to start those conversations as well. I mean, I know you said that, you know, maybe the professionals are, are using this most, but I could also see this being something that could be very, very helpful in an open house type setting where totally. community members are coming in and they're, they're trying to understand and really learn, especially if there's a lot of fear mongering and a lot of misinformation being circulated within the or within the community about well what what does it look like if you have a corner store what does it look like if you have a shop house and what does it look like if there's missing middle housing in the neighborhood will it really Absolutely. destroy the character of your neighborhood maybe maybe not let's talk about it yeah and there's there's some folks in georgia that were doing just that already you know they were taking these into um a public consultation and having people map out, you know, what do you think would work in this neighborhood? Right. And since the pictures are, they, you know, they're essentially a cartoon. They, um, they show the building that, you know, they're not hiding anything. In fact, this one that you can see on the screen right now that mm -hmm. says walk up apartment building, yeah. that's a real building under construction. It's designed by Marcus King. Um, and um, nice. it's uh, it's called the Sundial Building. It's being developed by Heirloom Properties in, in Minneapolis. That's Jim Kuman. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a real building. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I was just trying to, I, I can't make it look as good as Marcus does, but right, right. Like it, it's a real thing, but I think when people can see that it's not some boogeyman, uh, it really yeah. helps people understand. And I think it's also important when you're having conversations with the public or people that may be hesitant, um, you can start the conversation with, you know, which of these buildings have you lived in before? Right. <laughs> and, you know, I've lived in personally in so many of these different situations and shared houses and um, yeah, like I've done the co-living thing. I've done, I wish I could have done the ADU thing, but I have right. not had the privilege of living in a backyard cottage, but yeah. you know, I've lived in the apartment buildings. I've lived in the triplex. I've lived in the fourplex. I've lived in the duplex. I've lived in the semi-detached, like you, and I'm not a special person, right? So I, right, right. I imagine that there's a lot of people that throughout their their housing journey have really had great memories in a lot of buildings like this. And it helps talk about, you know, it helps uh, open a conversation around, you know, why, why can't we have more of them? Yeah, yeah. I love that we have something uh, a little rather fun, you know, here in the corner and uh, it's the, uh, <laughs> the value per acre stamp. Uh, this is like a nice little head nod towards uh, uh, Urban 3 Joe Minicozzi and this yeah. whole concept. Uh, talk a little bit about this because this is like a core tenant of, of Strong Towns and, and you know, the that, that philosophy uh, that, you know, as we started to spread further and further out, we just can't tax people enough to be able to support in the environment. Yeah, this is this is a totally boutique project or like product. <laughs> I only have a few of them left. Yeah. This was a specific request from it. John Anderson. <laughs> he said, hey, can you make this? And I said, I'll look into it. And I found like they're handmade yeah. in Nova Scotia. Like they're very <laughs> boutique. Um, <laughs> yeah, but this is a little stamp where yeah. the idea is... Um, either at the planning desk or if you are submitting an application for planning, um, again, very niche, <laughs> yeah. uh, you can stamp a project that's an info project and you can show the economic impact it's having on your city by adding you know, more life per acre, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a, a stamp where you can, it's metric and imperial, you can use yep. it in a cross border. Yep, <laughs> you stamp that. it on there and uh, you just, say, you know, here's, here's the value of the appraisal or the, the cost of the building that I'm, or the project that I'm constructing or repairing. Yeah. Here's the amount of area it's occupying. And so here's the, the value per acre and, um, or, or per hectare. Yeah. And that's a helpful metric that allows us to sort of compare to different forms of development where we're not accounting for the infrastructure cost as much as we need to, right. um, which, you know, just ends up kicking the can down the road and, and stressing municipal finances later. And so this is, uh, 
a, a problem I'm sure that you've talked about much with uh, with Chuck Marone. So I guess I can just direct uh, yeah. people to other Active Towns podcasts or the the Strong Towns um, movement if, yeah. if you wanted to learn more about that. Yeah. And that stamp is nicknamed the the Minicozy. Is it cool? Yes. <laughs> After Joe Minicozzi of After Urban Joe 3. After Joe Minicozzi, absolutely. <laughs> so um, it, it occurs to me two things that, you know, when looking at the, the step uh, cards is that um, it, it's a great a great way to, to start that conversation and talk a little bit about, you know, what these different housing typologies and building typologies are. But ultimately, you know, getting out into a neighborhood and being able to like intentionally like think about it and, and look at different building types. And, and, and that's, that brings back, you know, our conversation we were having earlier about being physically active within your, your, your community and walking around and seeing things at a certain level. Like when I look at this photo, I, 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 a couple of things, you know, jump out right away is the orientation to the sidewalk of the building itself. Uh, the the color just kind of pops and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. you know, the, in other words, and you're able to see things, too, at, you know, sort of this level of detail. And, you know, you're able to, like, really appreciate things at, at, at a finite level. Talk a little bit about how important and powerful that is, too, uh, to to not only, you know, be able to understand it or try to understand it in a two dimensional on, on a card, but then also get into your community, maybe go on a tour and be able to, to, to point out different housing and, and building types and have that discussion. Yeah, for sure. I mean, walks around my neighborhood are my biggest teacher for this sort of thing. Um, I'm constantly out there looking for Uh, counting water meters, counting electric meters to try and understand how many units, official units are in a building. Mm -hmm. I know which streets I am likely to run into somebody on their porch. Um, I know places where, you know, people tend to litter more and they or where they don't, Uh, places where it's it feels loud and places where it feels quiet. And, you know, you learn to associate that with the street trees. And um, there's there's so much that becomes real when you are looking for it in the neighborhood. And so, yeah. you know, I, I have countless, countless photos on my phone of just going for a run or going for a walk and just stopping and taking a picture of something that most people probably think I'm, I'm nuts, you know, like a completely mundane, or they think I'm a huge creep, or they think I'm a realtor or something that wants to, <laughs> uh, but you know, I, it, there's just tons of things to appreciate in that. And that has been, the the greatest teacher in learning how to try and depict these things in a friendly way as well. I also just want to you know publicly recognize Jennifer Settle, um, who taught me how to do so much of the the SketchUp design, and so she taught me a lot of the dimensions, for example, that go with either building code or traditional design. You know what is like a a pitch a roof pitch that looks natural to us. You know what is the this dimension for um, the steps on your porch or the depth of the porch and that sort of thing, the size of the doors. And so once you start piecing that together with what you see just built by humble people through the years and the things, there's also that there's survival bias, right? You know, things that are loved and that are well constructed end up lasting longer. And so in some ways we're seeing the best of, of what was built as well. And yeah, there, that's, that's just how it's done. And, you know, you showed a picture of, um, a little baby magnolia tree there. And that was something that I found in an alley. You know, I love walking the alleys. I absolutely love it. And there is just so much beauty in it. Like they planted a tree in the alley, like that itself is is beautiful. Right. They planted it perfectly aligned with their window, which is a really practical thing because this is a tree that's going to blossom. It's going to provide them extra privacy on the area of their house where they don't really have that privacy. Right. The color of the blossoms is just perfect with the brick, which they also painted. You can tell that this house is being paint- painted. Right. And th- it was right next to another tree that, you know, had a, a different blossoming time. And so they've almost kind of staged their vegetation so that it's it's going to be with them through the seasons. And I just thought it was beautiful for all of those reasons. And, yeah. um, <laughs> and, and 
it's everywhere. (laughs) It's everywhere. Like, you know, I can't take a walk without just being kind of overcome by the amount of love that is pouring out of every building through people that have been taking care of it for generations. And the one with the lights, yes, like the color popped out to me, but what I loved about the lights as well is they were leading back to the front door. And so I love that it just kind of hinged you off the sidewalk and said, Hey, like, welcome home. Um, and I love that they picked this warm color of light that also matched there. They picked a warm color of light in their living room. Right. And one right. of the greatest pleasures I find in life is walking at night. And and when people have their their living rooms and their kitchens lit up, and you yeah. and you know they have a door open, and you can smell the laundry being done, or when they're illuminated in this way, where you just get this like little peek into people's lives. And um, yeah, so that's what this building reminded me of. It just it's it's simple. Yeah. It's obviously a very nice house, you know. This is this is something that survived. It's not a cheap house, but like it's simple. It's not there's nothing fancy about it and yet right. it's it's quite perfect. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting too. You you mentioned the light and and being able to have just this little window into the lives of others and our neighbors and it reminds me of front porches too. And how important having some some connection with you know the the public realm, and so stoops, front stoops, front porches, um, areas where you can connect with other people, and I I find that to be just something that gets lost in our more modern suburban context when we think of you know the prototypical suburban environment in North America, whether it's, it, whether it's London, Ontario, fake London as, as Jason Slaughter from not just by <laughs> call it, or, you know, or anywhere USA in California or wherever else it's, it's like, yeah, insert car into garage, you know, go into your house through the, the door in the garage. You never even spend any time out in the front yard versus the way we used to build housing and neighborhoods and communities and sidewalks and orientation to the sidewalk and that sociability that gets reinforced when we are walking, biking, running, walking our dog in the neighborhood. Talk a little bit about that and how powerful that was for you moving to a new city, a new job, you know, Mm -hmm. and, 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 quote unquote, starting over in a new place, being able to grab your companion and set off in the neighborhood. Yeah. Well, and I would say, you know, a lot of this is not even um, like a suburban versus urban thing. I think a lot of it is design because what I've noticed, and I do notice this while I walk my dog, a lot of the new buildings are infill but they're not designed with that same conviviality and and there's just so much wisdom that's baked into these older designs that you don't really appreciate until you realize how much you interact with people in an older building versus a newer building so an example of that is um you know i run into people that have front porches and the front porch it's um the the nice thing about it is it's actually creating privacy in a way, mm-hmm. like right. it, it's shielding your house, um, not only from the sunshine and, you know, creating that sort of natural air conditioning effect um, or shading effect, but it's it's creating this middle layer right. where you can choose to be active in it, right. but it's putting those front windows far enough away that they don't, it's not quite in your face. And, and you see that in the difference with like the new modern or contemporary design that you see honestly, every city I've been to, so probably the same in Austin and wherever your listeners are as it is in Ottawa, is like the rectangular box, like the shadow box with like the massive front window, Mm -hmm. which is beautiful from an interior design perspective because you get all that light coming in and it's like these clean lines and it's horrible for a livability perspective because Mm -hmm. like when I'm walking through the neighborhood and I can see somebody's warm kitchen window Mm -hmm. i want like a little glimpse i don't want the whole thing (laughs) if 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 you if everyone can see your whole house everything that you're doing in there you don't feel comfortable living in it and so what i end up seeing all the time is people that have these big modern designs have the blinds drawn right Right. they don't want (laughs) because it's they they've been put on show 
Um, and so, yes, I definitely notice when I'm out walking my dog, my, I have a couple neighbors down the street that have, mm. they're in old buildings. These buildings are not fancy at all. I run into them all the time because they right. have front porches yeah. that they actually sit in. Yeah. And those front porches can also be shielded by trees. So it's right. like, there's so many layers of how you get to choose how much you want to interact yeah. and be social. I live in a building right now where I have met a couple of my neighbors, but I haven't necessarily run into them. So I'm in, a, in a, like an apartment building right. and we don't really run into each other outside of our doors. Right. I've met them because one of them happens to be my optometrist, you know, <laughs> like I met them out in right. the community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's, uh, it, it's difficult in a way moving to a type of building that I, I guess I'm noticing is not creating those same interactions of older buildings that yeah. I've lived in. Yeah. And definitely the, the dog makes a huge difference. I say this all the time, but um, <laughs> it's uh, there. She, she's running hills with me there and she's working hard. Um, <laughs> this is Jeannie. One of the, the greatest parts of having a dog is people feel comfortable talking to me. Yeah. And I'm particularly like, I'm a very social person. Like I like it when strangers talk to me. Um, so for me, it's not bothersome as it would be to many people if, you know, like an older man came up to me and talked to me. To me, I'm like, oh, that just made my day, a stranger. You know, obviously within reason. Right. right, right. <laughs> but I like that the dog allows that to happen at a time when it's very uncomfortable, I think, for like people don't necessarily feel comfortable talking to strangers because they don't know if someone's going to be offended or they don't know right. someone's level of personal comfort. And um, the, the part of Jeannie, like, I mean, she's obviously very cute, but Jeannie is also like actively transmitting my energy out into the world. Cause that right. is what <laughs> a dog does is they yes. absorb you. And yeah. you know, it's not just that she's happy. She can tell that I'm happy. She can yeah. tell that I'm comfortable. And so it's, um, <laughs> and, and so it's just, athletic, just like you, <laughs> I keep her. Yeah. You know, I was only allowed to adopt her because I'm a, I'm a long distance runner. Yeah. I don't have a yard and anyone who's tried to adopt a dog knows that that's, they have never let you adopt a dog unless you have a fenced yard. And yeah, for yeah. me, yeah. running saved me and it saved yeah. her too. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think this is her bounding around in the snow here. Yeah. There she she's is. She's a Southern dog, but she loves the winter <laughs> when she's got her jacket on. Yeah. That's so great. <laughs> so the, the the dog connection and, and 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 as you mentioned it 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 really does sort of like really kind of soften things up and, and encourage sociability between people and and I notice that when I'm in the front yard of, of our place is that uh, we don't have we don't have dogs uh, as pets we have two hens two chickens <laughs> as pets also lovely <laughs> and uh, and they kind of stay in the backyard and they do their own thing that's their realm but in the front yard um, you know our neighbors will be walking by and they'll be walking their dogs and they'll see me you know uh, we don't have a front porch but we have a, a live oak with two chairs set out in, in the front yard and so I'll hang out there and just sort of you know read a book or, or do something or, or sip on a beer or whatever. And folks will be walking by. And it, I just noticed that having the dog really opens things up for a lot of people, you know, like even if it's two different sets of people walking, you know, the opposite direction and the dogs want to say hi to each other, you know, yeah. in a friendly way, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it, it's all of a sudden conversations start, start up. And uh, I think it's just, there's something magical in canine urbanism, yeah. <laughs> you know, that takes place. So yeah. it's, and, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that it, it helped you making those connections within your, your new community. For sure. And, and I think it, it also makes me way more recognizable because like I'm a, I'm a pretty unremarkable looking person, but when I'm with the dog, like the two of us, it just kind of reminds me when you said like dogs and urbanism, it rhy reminds me of the opening scenes of um, 101 Dalmatians <laughs> where yeah. you have all the dogs in the windows and they're kind of connected to their owners yeah. um, and you can match them. I used to have a little like a puzzle as a kid where you would match the dog to the owner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
but it, it has actually helped in that way as well. Cause not only do people feel like they can come up and talk to me, but they recognize me as like the girl with the dog. Right, <laughs> and right. so, um, I become a friendly face and, uh, I often act as sort of the welcome wagon at, at run crew. Now I'm not the new person anymore. Right. And so right. I often will be someone who welcomes others because like I will say hello. And immediately my dog is, you know, all up in their business wanting pets and, you yeah. know, saying, I love you. Yeah. So yeah, this is one of this is one of the the run clubs that I okay. am just so ecstatic to be a part of. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're such positive energy, and Jeannie comes with this to me uh, with me to that. So Jeannie yeah. and I were actually leading this exercise. We were doing um, a hills workout. And so I had uh, Jeannie's breakfast at the top of the hill uh-huh. and everybody had to run to the top of the hill and grab a kibble and then bring it back down to her. <laughs> so, uh, and this one we were just participating in. Somebody was leading sort of a, a boxing sort of it, like football drills workout with us. Um, yeah. And yeah, and there's other dogs that are there too. And it's just, um, it's just a great time. Yeah. Talk a little bit about this connection because i i think from an active town's perspective when i think about creating a culture of activity i find that so often when a a community gets the reputation of being a community that supports healthy active living there's these social support networks and groups that are that are in place and and it takes you know it, it takes somebody being you know brave enough to as a newbie to be able to reach out and want to join it and and give it a try but then it also takes a a fair amount of dedication from volunteers to be able to to give back and keep it going like you said you're not no longer the newbie but now you're helping lead things talk a little bit about the power of of you know being able to do that being able to have um you know, to create that sort of culture of, mm-hmm. of connection and sociability and physical activity. Yeah, and this group is a, is a perfect example of that because it's it's organized, actually, the, the guy you can see here with the hat, his yeah. name's Stephen, he's, he's we, we jokingly call him the mayor mayor of free fitness in Ottawa. Yeah. And he organizes so much and he's um, he's very, he's really welcoming and he has amazing energy and he always makes sure to, um, like actively tag or invite people on social media. So yeah. if you show up, you know, like the first time I showed up, he was tagging me in every, you know, in every future one saying like, come to the next one, come to the next one. Yeah. Um, so I don't know how he does it, honestly. Like when you're saying yeah. it, it takes a lot of volunteer power, I don't know how Stephen does it, but he makes well, he, such and, a- he, and he does a good job of engaging people too. Let's, let's oh, press, absolutely. Let's press play so, yeah. on this. Let's press play on this video. And I do have the vol- volume up. <laughs> oh, on you've it. got the volume on this one. I do, okay. Yeah. yeah. Grayson, day two. It's over. Nice. I love it. That's so cool. <laughs> what a gr- what a great vibe that's there, and you can just feel the energy of the group, and and that's so incredibly powerful. When you think about the things that need to happen to be able to help behavior change and help people create healthy habits and be able to keep things going. Um, It's so important to have that kind of feedback and energy and positive reinforcement. I mean, you had to be beaming, I'm sure. Well, and, and, you know, I was one of several volunteers that hosted workouts for that. And part of this group that makes it especially um, important to me is they actually do community work as well. So I think there's another photo in there of, of us doing some gardening work. So Stephen will actually partner with all kinds of charities or um, or community groups, and he'll kind of rally the run group to go and do that. So he also organized that we did a float at the Pride Parade. We wanted to make sure that, you know, people felt really, really welcome at this run club. Um, and uh, yeah, this is a whole bunch of volunteers from that run club that are, are doing some invasive species removal um, in, a, in the area where we meet up, you know, so it's giving back saying, you know, we meet up in this place uh, every week and this is run by volunteers. And, and so you're introduced to, you're able to kind of cross pollinate with different volunteer groups in the city and because everybody's got multiple interests, but you're also forming these relationships outside of of just the fitness and um and so i think there's so much of you know what stephen puts into what he does that 
everyone just wants to give even like a portion of that back in being enthusiastic and in showing up and volunteering when other people are hosting a workout you know you you bring your energy and show that they're appreciated and so you know it it's a really rare thing i i haven't experienced anything quite like this particular group it's yeah. become like a really really fun a fun a fun place like you know and i I joined in particular for Jeannie because like yeah. she could really participate in this one. Like I will say, you know, she's getting a little bit older and I'm getting a little bit faster. So it's harder. It's harder for me to sync up my, my workouts with Jeannie, but she right. can do that one because she's able to be off leash. Yeah. And, um, and so I kind of started going for her and now it's, you know, it's for both of us. Like I feel like she's as much a part of the group as I am. And it's like really, it's a really important thing for me. And they do that all year. Yeah. Ottawa gets to negative 40 degrees Celsius, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> they, they do that in the dark. <laughs> I shouldn't say they, we, uh, we, we do that yeah. in the dark on Friday mornings that, you know, before sunrise Yeah. in that temperature. And you do it because I don't know, like everyone's just kind of committed to, to showing up for each other. Right, right. You know, I like to say that, uh, you know, every community, if you're if you're striving to create this, you know, this culture of activity, you need you need, need ingredients, you need, you know, an environment that's that, that supports it. In other words, a built environment that and supports it, uh, some some activity assets, some natural uh, features that, that support it. But you also need activity ambassadors. You need these types of groups that pull together and you need individuals where they're just like, come on, let's get outside. Let's get it. Let's get, let's do this. Let's do this together. We'll support you. If you're a newbie, we'll, we'll, we'll guide you and, and help you along the way. And, uh, and it's so important. And I think especially with bikes, especially with cycling. And is this your ride? That's my ride. That's, Yay. that's one of my rides. That's, that's my, that's rides. my race car. Okay. <laughs> I also have my, like my old, uh, clunker not a clunker it's it's just a heavy yep. i'll call it my suv my heavy one that's got a basket on it and, yeah you're, you know. you're your commuter or your you know get around town and do stuff and then here here's a, a, a group uh heading out for a ride where were you headed on this ride we biked to a brewery so it was a really low-key ride i mean we nice. still you know it was still good exercise but we biked out to the brewery in the summer and then um there was a food truck that everybody got some lunch from and we biked home yeah. uh, and that was my first time getting out with a group in Ottawa and all of these friends actually met through running or one degree of separation away from running. Okay. Uh, and then everybody was like, Oh, do you bike? Do you bike? And then, you know, there's sort of like this offshoot. It's not a formal group or anything. It's just, you know, right, like there's right. a million group chats that go on and, and you, you invite people and say, Hey, are you free this weekend? And, and yeah. then you've, you've got new things going on. So, and you sent over some uh, amazing shots that really exemplify the fact that uh, the, the area is not exactly flat. So, no. <laughs> what's going on in this shot? <laughs> so this is, uh, this is a famous place. I kept on seeing people on Strava and everything go to what they call Champlain Lookout. And so I knew that this was like a destination. It's a little bit far for a run. It would be like a 50K <laughs> okay. round trip run. So I'm not an ultra runner. I am a marathon runner, but not an ultra. And, uh, and so I was quite nervous to do it, but I went out with a, a friend to um, to give it a shot. And it was, it was fine. I loved biking. it. It turns out I love, I love cycling elevation. Yes. Absolutely cycling love it. it. Yeah. Yeah. So but you, then I was reflecting cause it was that it was the same yeah. week actually as like the, the hill hell week that we did with them, um, our freedom mm -hmm. hill club, where it was like running that other workout. Yeah. And I was reflecting after that in all of these cities that I've lived in, I don't even know that I would actually recognize that there is elevation unless I ran or cycled because yeah. When you're on wheels or like if you're on rollerblades or a skateboard or something like that, you notice like one degree yeah. grade. Like you notice any level of hill. And the same with running. Like if you're running hard enough, if you're doing a speed workout or you're, you're trying to time yourself on like a different route, yeah. you really notice the terrain. Yeah. And it just hit me that I have running to thank for so much. Like I, I don't, I would have a completely different map of the city and right. and sort of like emotional understanding of the terrain around me 
if I didn't run. And even just my perception of distance, like I know how far things are in city because I know how far, how yeah. hard it is to run there and back or how fast I can run there and back uh, because I don't have a great sense of, of distance or, you know, spatial sense otherwise, right, right. I will say. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, this is, um, this is what the most famous hill in, uh, in Ottawa. This is Parliament Hill, actually. These stairs go up to it. So, you know, behind the photograph would be the Parliament buildings and, mm you realize it's a hill when you have to run those stairs (laughs) 10 times. And yeah, it just, um, I find it just creates this really uh, intimate relationship with the land of like, of just knowing, of knowing the place you're in when you're doing intense cardio (laughs) to get around Mm because it just gets really hard or it gets really easy. You know, it's nice to go downhill. There's certain places where, there's certain places in town that almost take on a personality because it's a hill. Like right. you, you reach it and you're like, Oh, you again, like we <laughs> yeah. meet again, you know, like I know you, I know how this is going to be. And you almost have like a relationship with that place because yeah. of how hard it is. And yeah. And like, there's, there's places that you go in town where like, even if you're walking, you're all, almost in a way like filled with relief because you know, it's, Every, it feels like you're walking. What is it in the Lord of the Rings when the Ents are like, oh, I always feel like we're walking yeah. south or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Downhill when you're going south. I have no idea if that was an appropriate quote. <laughs> so someone please correct me. <laughs> but I remember, you know, it's uh, it, you've, you have this kind of reaction to the place that you're in. Yeah. That if I weren't a runner, I don't think, I, I don't think I've even appreciated how much I've absorbed. Yeah. Because I love to run. One of the things I, I really, really appreciate about active mobility, whether it's walking, uh, running, cycling, is that you get to appreciate and really understand your community, your city at a much more intimate level. You just mentioned about, you know, you really feel the incline, you know, and, and weather too. You really feel mm-hmm. the weather. Weather. If we're, you know, in a car, if we're in a hermetically sealed environment, you, you just don't have an appreciation for for your environment around you. Yeah, yeah. And weather weather was something that I'm an all weather runner. Uh, yeah. So I didn't even really appreciate weather until cycling and until water stuff. Because as soon as I got a paddleboard, I had to be really sensitive to wind because I, I got out there. Uh, I went out there one day with my dog and I was teaching her how to be on the paddleboard. And it was it just happened to be like a windy day on the lake. There she is, her, her homemade uh, life jacket. If anyone wants to make that at home and you happen to have a, a backpack for your dog, just cut up a pool noodle and put it in. It works perfectly. Just make sure their head stays afloat. <laughs> um yeah, but I, I took her out there on a windy day and she kept jumping off. Um, and, you know, I couldn't tell if she was enjoying the swimming or not. But I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to get us back to shore. And so I learned a lesson the hard way because I was out there alone with her. And um, yeah, so now it's, you know, I'm paying attention to is it windy and where is it windy? Uh, and you're really paying attention to the quality of the water as well. And there's certain things that you can only really see from the water like you get a completely different perspective of the city when you're in the middle of the river and you're looking at the banks and um and i discovered parts of the city that are kind of off limits uh in unless you own the property right it's private property they have like really nice waterfront property but it's basically off limits to you unless you go in the public area and the only public area is the water so yeah, there's, it, it has just been um, a different perspective. And, and I'm, I'm quite actually afraid of, I'm not a strong swimmer. And uh, I struggle with like fear in water. And so it was a big thing for me to kind of get into that this year. And that's the other thing I'm discovering is it's not as, as scary as I thought it would be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, these are that's... calm lakes, though. They're not, uh, it's not like, you know, lake here on or yeah. it's not the other water i've been exposed to has been you know living in the east coast which is the atlantic ocean no don't don't go swim don't go swimming in new brunswick at uh lake here on which is not to be messed with either yeah and speaking of a different perspective you know here's a great example of uh, getting out on the paddleboard at night and being able to to float on up and be able to appreciate uh the the fireworks show from a different perspective so 
Absolutely. Yeah, there's a whole group of us that went out there and we were in there with, you know, between all of the yachts and the motor boats and that sort of thing. And there was just a whole bunch of us on our paddle boats uh, getting to our paddle boards, enjoying that. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Is there anything that we haven't yet talked about that you want to make sure that we mention? Mm. I don't know. I just kind of came up and showed up here for the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I do want to make sure that we 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 touch upon that um, that W word, uh, the winter word. Oh yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, of course. Uh, so you know, there's there's a a great you know image here of you and Jeannie, uh, you know, out going for a stroll here in, in the snow and in in the cold. Um, but I I love this little uh, video uh, clip that you that you have here. You're like, yep. We're doing it. Oh, ecstatic. We're that was the it. first big snow in Ottawa. That was, you know, like it had been cold for a while, but it was finally <laughs> snow that was sticking on the ground. Yeah. And that was my first, yeah, that was my first experience of yeah. like last winter was, I love winter and last winter was like pretty rough in Ottawa. Uh, uh, it was very cold and we had, a, uh, we had another lockdown. And so mm -hmm. you couldn't really do anything other than walk outside in negative 40 degrees. Yeah, it was yeah. like... <laughs> But there was one thing actually we could do, and this is something that I'm so intensely excited for and so grateful for. I've never had this in my life. We have a seven kilometer ice rink outside in Ottawa. Ah, nice. Yeah. So the, the canal um, in town, like mm -hmm. they convert it into this skating rink. Right. And that was open and that was available. And so I would, I had to actually, it was so cold, I had to drive down there. Because mm -hmm. I couldn't carry my skates the whole way. So I would drive down there and I'd race and like you had like 10 seconds to get your skates on before mm -hmm. your hands would just be eviscerated. Yeah. And yeah, but and the thing that I found so fun about it last winter was if you didn't skate really fast, you would just like die of exposure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not a very good skater, but I yeah. had to like, you know, pick it up. Right. I haven't done it since I was a kid, but yeah. I I don't know if I've ever had that kind of experience. I guess, you know. I, you just, I can't describe the joy of just being able to just gun it on right. your skates for like, you don't have to turn, you don't have to do it. Like you can just go for yeah. seven kilometers and then you turn and you come back. So it's 14 kilometers. It's great. Wow. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that was, um, that was an, a massive perk of the winter. And, uh, you know, I did run throughout the winter, but like the skating was so much fun that I got into yeah. that. And this year I'm looking forward to learning how to skate ski as well. It's a uh, very popular okay. area for cross country skiing. Right. And yeah, so I would just say, you know, it's almost when I lived in Toronto, winter just felt like a very long November. It was just right. kind of like gray and wet. And being in Ottawa is more like living in when I was in New Brunswick, where you get a proper winter, the snow stays on the ground and it's really cold. Right, right but it opens up this new world for you where you can right. do the things that require snow and they, right. um, and they're pretty darn fun. Yeah. 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 It's, funny, it's funny too, because that reminds me of an interview that I did, um, uh, with, uh, Pekka Tokola in Olu, Finland. And, you know, they're, they're pretty close to the Arctic circle. <laughs> you know, they're pretty far up there and they're much further North than Helsinki. And, and uh, we were talking about the fact that, yeah, I mean, you just wear proper clothing and, yep. you know, in, in Olu, they have a massive network of off street um, cycle paths everywhere. And so that's how all the kids get to school is they all jump on their bikes and they all ride to school and they have an intense um, main maintenance system of conditioning the uh, the snowpack on the cycle paths to make sure that they have, they're always grippy through all, all through the, the dead of winter. And then they have, uh, you know, lighting, you know, excellent lighting because it's dark most of the day there. Yeah. And so it, it just reminds me of the fact that, you know, we can't use winter as an excuse for not, you know, getting out there, not walking, not biking, not running. It's, you just have to have the proper clothing you know, be reasonable about, you know, the conditions that you have out there. And, uh, and from a municipal standpoint, from a city perspective, you know, have proper maintenance of said facilities so that it's, you know, not an ice rink when you don't intend it to be an ice rink. Right. Right. <laughs> so. Yeah. And the, I'm interested in, in Finland, what were, what 
what do they wear for their gear there? Because you know, I have I have my yeah. list, but I want to hear what Finland does. What did you what I, he has an excellent YouTube channel. Now we we actually he did a fantastic episode, and so folks, if you haven't seen this episode, you got to go check out uh, that particular episode. I'll make sure I'll have a link in the in the description video description in the show notes uh, for this episode. It's fantastic. His channel he goes into a lot of detail of winter riding. But uh, when I was interviewing him, he wanted to do something different. He wanted to actually do a live ride. And so he rode wow. while we talked. And so it was summertime. And so we didn't really get into a lot of the winter conversation. But my senses and from what he was telling me is that you just wear kind of normal clothing. And yeah. because you're exerting, you're because you're moving, like you were talking about with skating, because you're moving, you're creating heat. And so, if anything, you want to make sure you're not overdressing for the situation. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and, yeah, and, I, and I that's what we know as runners. We know that you know we could we could totally overdress for the occasion, and then we start sweating. And if you start sweating, then you start getting really cold. So, yeah, yeah, it's that finding that balance. So. Yeah, yeah, and the, the, I mean, for cycling, I guess you have wind to deal with, but for running, mm-hmm. yeah, you can just kind of get away. I find wool is perfect and you don't even need to have that much of it because it doesn't yeah. get stinky. Yeah. And I have, a, I think I have a picture in there something I tried this year, which is, um, I put screws in the bottom of my shoes. I oh, took yeah. an old pair of running shoes Yeah. and I can recommend that it does work. You need to make sure that your shoe has enough of, um, I mean the, now the trend is big cushy shoes. I'm like a minimalist yeah. runner. So it was yeah. really hard for me to find shoes where I couldn't feel the screws underneath. Yeah. But yeah, as long as you get a hex screw, like yep. I can, this is like a $2 solution to your winter running and you yep. can even take them out at the end of the season. It's not going to ruin your shoe. Um, so yeah, I learned that from the Ottawa running community. Um, you just want to make sure the screw has like the hex pattern on it. So it's got a yep. sharp edge yep. and uh, that's awesome. And then if you, um, if you just wear wool socks, like, Wool, wool is your best friend. Wool is the secret to, to winter yeah. running. If any of you are thinking about it, yeah, I recommend it. It's great. I love it. I love it. Grayson, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a pleasure catching up with you. Thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button and ring the notification bell next to it to, to customize your notification preferences. I'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Chats, uh, making purchases from the Active Towns store, and also donating to the nonprofit. Thank you all so very much. I simply could not do this without you.